Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, happy Monday. Welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast. This episode is brought to you by the University of Elk Hunting. Corey Jacobson, Elk 101, have put together a fully comprehensive course for beginners all the way to elite elk hunters and everywhere in between. I'm going to be going to be recording with Corey again this week to go through another couple sections of his course, and we're going to go through the conditioning and the physical conditioning and the gear side of things to to kind of further along this process as I've brought been bringing him on. His course goes in a lot more detail on that. So Corey has offered all of the East Meets West listeners. 20% off the annual membership by entering in the code East Meets West at checkout. Save yourself 20% or $20 on that annual membership. Also, Maven Optics. So, Maven has built the highest quality optics at a lower price than their competitors through their direct to consumer business model. You can only buy their products online or at shows. And they have just released the pre-sale on their new spotting scope. And this small 12 to 27 spotter packs up extremely small, weighs in at just two pounds, but still has the same high quality glass that you have in the other optics that they've had and their, their large spotting scope, but just in a smaller package. That'll definitely be in my pack this year going to Idaho. So... Use the code East Meets West dash gift. Get yourself a free gift with any full price optics order. And lastly, Heather's Choice. So Heather's created these healthy meal options for the backcountry hunter, for the hiker, traveler, adventurer, whatever you might be. Um, I even snack on some of the packers at work. But awesome healthy meal choice options to actually fuel you in the back country rather than just giving you a whole bunch of sodium and carbohydrates. All right, so to kind of go into a brief intro here, uh, I've been further going along with my scouting process and figuring things out for Idaho, is that's where I've kind of threw my dart and that's where I'm going to elk hunt this year. And been doing a lot of e-scouting for the most part, Google Earth. I'm going to do a little bit actually here today, a little more. And and in addition to that, just trying to make sure I'm familiar with all the regulations, which I haven't bought my tag yet. With but, um, you know they some of the units do have quotas. So even though they're over the counter tags, they have certain amount of quotas. As I've already missed one of the units I was looking at, but hey, it's a learning learning experience. I didn't think it would sell out so quick. And also there's the way they have their, their tag allocation. There's certain units that you can go that you can buy an over the counter elk tag, a mule deer tag that can be used for either mule deer, white tail or mountain lion, which is pretty cool. So, and then also wolf tags, and bear tags and your deer tag actually i think could be used for a bear as well don't quote me on that i'm gonna have to double check but i believe it's um that way that some of those tags can be used for what they consider a lesser animal um for lack of better terms but that's what's uh, what's really drawn me a lot to idaho is just these opportunities to have all these tags in your pocket which don't get me wrong my main focus is going to be elk and that's what i'm hunting is elk because once you start trying to hunt everything i think you can really cloud things but the fact that you can have those tags in your pocket if you come across it or you see a big muley in a base and you want to try to put a stock on i mean for me i think that's that's a pretty awesome opportunity to be able to come home you know with something there and in addition to that something i learned with idaho is you can get two elk tags in a season even as a non-resident say because they sell the tags for within zones and 
So say you're in this zone that comprises of anywhere from two to five units. And you want to hunt a border of, say, the two different two units right next to each other. You can get a bull elk tag, or I think it's either sex elk tag, for both units. So you can actually fill two tags, or just for the fact that most people do it, the fact that, that if they cross over that boundary line, you're not stuck from pursuing that at that point. So really, really cool um, concept that they have going on there in Idaho. And I, I really didn't even know that they did that until recently. And the more I've been you know, studying up on it and, and looking into it. It's a little bit further drive than going to Colorado or some of those other, even Montana. But I think uh, I think it's going to be a pretty cool experience either way. Not saying it's going to be a better hunt. Not going to say there's well, well, statistically Colorado has more elk, but for me it just seems like uh, this is this is a nice choice to to go. I, I like the the opportunities that are available there. So we'll give it a shot and see if it doesn't work. Then you just keep moving on but i actually read a quote here let me see if i can find it i read a quote from dustin rowe who is a sick athlete and he's also a guide up in canada and let me see if i can find that here all right so he says that every area that has a sheep quota will have rams I'm never worried about hunting an area that people call bad and not finding sheep. They are there. You just need to find them. To be honest, these bad areas have accounted for some of the best rams in my photo book. I don't think they're bad areas at all. I think guides get lazy. Some hunters don't do what it takes, and you just need to be there to be lucky. So, I mean, Dustin was obviously referring to sheep here and this one, but I think it can go that way with any species and makes me really, you know, try to... I don't want to say dumb down my scouting, but not get so worked up over trying to find the best hidden gem, this or that, you know, you have a chance anywhere. Just work, work hard for it and, you know, throw a dot at the map and essentially, I mean, look, looking a little more into it than that, but you can, you can plan out a, a hunt and do pretty, do pretty good by just having that mindset and just working hard for it. So I thought that was, that was really, really interesting to uh, hear Dustin's perspective on that. So, all right, so kind of moving on there from Idaho. Total Archery Challenge is coming up here in Seven Springs, Pennsylvania, May 30th through June 2nd. I will have a booth there. I will be selling my apparel with some pretty cool giveaway things for people that that end up purchasing them. And also going to have some Maven Optics on site for people to get to check out, look through, and even place orders through me right there. I'll, I'm hoping to have the new spotter there that no one's got to see yet. So pretty pumped on, on that to everyone get to check that out. And then lastly here, the podcast I'm doing today is with Mark Hulsing, um from the Hunt Backcountry podcast and XL Mountain Gear. So Mark, I asked him to come on to talk all through his September elk gear list. Let's just geek out on gear, go through his pack. What's it take to do a four to five day bivy style hunt or base camp hunt? And we just really dove into that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my gear list together here this week and get it up in a blog post on the website for everyone to be able to check out, see how it kind of differs from Mark's stuff. And a lot of it's, you know, very similar and a lot of things I'll be changing to kind of lighten my load a little bit, so to speak. So yeah, definitely be looking forward to that. Otherwise, let's get into the podcast here. So Mark Hilsing, Exo Mountain Gear, enjoy all right welcome back to another episode of the east meets west hunt podcast so tonight i have on the line a special guest here mark hulsing how's it going buddy very good thank you so what's going on tonight where where are you at mark um at home which is missouri so midwest boy uh, can very much relate to the premise of this podcast being kind of east goes west because that's uh, part of my story, which I'm sure we might talk about a little bit. But yeah, I'm home in Missouri here. Cool. Yeah, it's it's funny. Like I said, I'll ask you here about your background, but 
I had, when I first started looking into going out west, I came across a, a blog that, that you had. It's called Soul Adventure. Am I right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, and about, you know, this Midwestern guy that's writing about his experiences going out west and, and learned a lot from it. And, and then eventually Mark uh, has a podcast, The Hunt Backcountry, and learned a lot from it there. So w- when I started this podcast, Mark, you were one of the ones that uh, had had an eye on to have have on the, as a guest for quite a while. Oh, I appreciate that, man. Yeah. So if you want, do you want to get into a little bit of your background and, and who you are? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's uh, it's nothing too special, as you mentioned, just kind of a regular guy from the Midwest. Um, in terms of hunting, I grew up hunting a bit with my grandfather when I was young, small game, whitetail, that type of thing. Kind of got out of it during the middle school, high school, college years was just, you know, playing sports, working and that type of thing and didn't hunt much. And when I graduated college and basically had my own free time and a little bit of free money and, you know, my own autonomy to kind of do what I wanted to do, I wanted to hunt again. And uh, that quickly just escalated, I would say. I picked up a bow for the first time after college, completely fell in love with bow hunting. I originally picked up a bow just to extend my season here in Missouri and had zero idea how uh, how much bow hunting would change me and how much I would love to shoot a bow. Um, just dove deep into the technical aspects of archery and then into bow hunting and then just started planning to hunt out west for elk. Um, and it doesn't feel like very long ago, but at the same time, so much has changed in the hunting world uh, over the past seven, eight years, however long it's been, that uh, yeah, back at that time, there wasn't Onyx Maps, there wasn't podcasts like this, there wasn't great online resources like the University of Elk Hunting. And so as a Midwest guy who didn't know anyone who hunted out West, it was literally kind of on my own trying to piece together information from forums and magazines and all that type of thing. And I started writing a little bit, uh, as you mentioned about my own journey at that blog, Soul Adventure, I had zero like intentions or plans for that. I was really just documenting it for myself to remember the process and even to go back to and learn from myself in terms of what I was learning about bow hunting and hunting the West and hunting elk. And that picked up some traction somehow and started writing for some other places. And then I kind of got involved in the the quote unquote industry, if you will, and somehow fast forward uh, some years here later and um, work for Exo Mountain Gear. Me, uh, you know, we make backcountry hunting packs uh, and part of the a whole host of duties uh, with Exo Mountain Gear is we have that podcast, the Hunt Back Country podcast. So Steve and I uh, host and co-host that and get to talk to some amazing people on that show. And I honestly feel like every time we fire up a podcast, super excited because I'm I'm there to learn uh, just like the listeners are from the guests. So it's really fun to be able to do that. Yeah, no, that's the same, same thing with me with uh, the podcast. You know, I don't, I didn't come on here to show my knowledge i came on to learn from others and you know hopefully be able to have the listeners be able to you know pull some valuable information out of it yeah yeah likewise man it's uh it it, honestly it's a little bit awkward and says oh i love your podcast like the only thing i could maybe attribute that to is that i ask good (laughs) questions (laughs) not that i'm a great hunter or have all the answers but hopefully at least ask some good questions and get some good info and i honestly i think a lot of that's because i'm again like i'm personally curious about all this stuff so um yeah it's just it's a fun it's a fun thing to do and have those conversations yeah it's it's funny when uh i i always i say this a bunch but i'm like if someone's going to ask me how to kill an elk, I'm going to definitely defer you to somebody else. Um, but when it comes to planning a hunt, I can, I can help out a little bit on those side of things, you know, but I want to, yeah. I want to learn from some other people and, and, you know, hopefully better my own hunting and then just, and help everyone else in the process. Yeah. I, I can uh, tell some folks a bunch of what not to do's as well. <laughs> that's funny yeah I, I i think in my three years experience my short three years of experience i uh i can i can talk a lot about things not to do <laughs> that's cool i don't know uh in those three years have were they all for elk as you've gone out west for three years yeah yeah they've all been for elk and i have not filled a tag yet i've 
Okay. Ben was it all, all archery? Yes, all archery. Yeah, so. I mean, it, I mean that's uh, like as much as the internet may say otherwise, or you see like the quote unquote famous guys or something do something else. Like it, the average guy, not even from out east going west, but even if you look at a lot of the guys who you know don't have a ton of time to hunt and even hunt in, in their home state of Colorado, Idaho, Washington, et cetera, like. There's very, very few guys filling a tag every year. Very, very few. So um, I remember I was both encouraged and depressed on my very first elk hunt. I didn't fill a tag. I ran into a guy. Um, we were in Colorado. He was packing in, and the, they were coming through with, like, really light packs. Nothing in their packs, but had frames. And so I got talking to him, and they had packed out a bull the previous day. They were heading back in to get their camp and some other gear and pack it back out. But it was the very first bull he had ever shot. Um, and it was his seventh year of archery hunting. And so this is a guy who has at least some time to scout in his home state and some time to hunt in his home state. And it took seven years. And I, it, on one hand I was like really bummed by that. And then on the other hand, I was very much fired up by like, I'm going to stick with this, you know, no matter what, right? Like if it takes seven years, I hope it doesn't, but if it takes seven years, I'm gonna stick with it. And, uh, Yeah, I mean, it didn't take seven years, but at the same time, like, there's so much each time. Like, it's so cliche to say, but to me, it's much more about filling a tag. Um, And a hunt to me is much is is much about like the adventure and testing myself and spending time outdoors and hopefully spending time with some really good people and all that stuff. And yeah, your the purpose is to hunt, right? The purpose is to fill a tag, but um, yeah, as cliche as it is, if you don't fill a tag, it's not unsuccessful. Yeah. I mean, it it just drives me to keep wanting to go back and keep better in myself. It's just, I I felt like I was just teased so many times out there. I'd have, I'd have these amazing encounters and I'd screw it up every time. Like I, I somehow I got into elk. It just was, wasn't, uh, it just didn't pan out my way for, for a variety of reasons. But then, you know, so like you said, you you know, a short amount of time, five to seven days of hunting. And then this last year I, I was able to get off work for 14 days of hunting straight in Colorado and one that just completely destroys you. Yeah, it's a grind, man. <laughs> and and two, it I mean it took me 7 days this year to find elk in a spot that I'd been 2 years in a row and I was finding elk but it was just so dry that that um they weren't in the high country, they were seemed to be on the private land that was down lower. I ended up moving units before I finally got into elk, but it was, it was a grind. Like you said, it was just, you know, it was a little depressing driving back, you know, without a a tag filled again. But at the same time, I just was thinking about planning next year's, you know, adventure to do it. So. Yeah, this was a super tough year in Colorado. Um, The week that I was out there was the exact same as you. Incredibly hot, incredibly dry, um, elk were not high at all. The most of the elk we found were low on private. Like it was, it was a tough year. So you definitely weren't alone in that one. Yeah. What time of year were you out there? I want to say we started hunting on the eighth or the ninth, um, somewhere right in there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I went from the first through the 14th. So yeah. So we were definitely overlapped there for a good portion of, you know, f- at least five or six days or something right there. Yeah. I started up at around 11,000 feet where I'd gotten into the elk before. And I ended up where we got into bulls was down at like 7,500 in a completely different unit. And it was, <laughs> had to go where the water was and, and just yeah. keep moving until we found elk. But it, it was definitely a, a grind. That's for sure. Right. But so what, uh, real quick, Mark, what, what do you do for Exo mountain gear? Um, that's a really good question. (laughs) It it totally (laughs) depends on the day. It's funny being, uh, you know, being a small company is you just wear so many hats. You do so many different things. There's not these like clear, clean, defined roles. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've been helping in some capacity with Exo Mountain Gear since the beginning. So, uh, we started in 2014, Steve Speck and Lenny Nelson co-founded Exo Mountain Gear I knew Steve at the time, had worked with him a little bit in some other projects before and basically helped him on like the technical side of things and, and some of that since the beginning. And then over over the years have uh, made the jump and went full time and 
you know, as we talked about that transition and me going full time, like I still have no idea what my job title is. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it's very, it's very, uh, uh, fluid situation, but anything from, um, a lot of the technical stuff still, um, and then the podcast, a lot of the marketing, a lot of just customer interaction as well. I mean, we're, we're a small team and honestly, we want to keep it small on purpose. Like we want to, we only sell direct. So like we don't have dealers or retailers and there's a bunch of reasons for that. But honestly, one of the reasons is we want to work directly with the people using the product. And so being able to, to work directly with people and, you know, get them set up the right way and then address like any questions they have. And then honestly, like hearing the stories throughout and after hunting season of all of our customers is so stinking fun. So yeah, man, it's a, it's a bunch of different, a bunch of different duties and roles and responsibilities that is just part of being a real small company with a small team. Yeah, no, that's, that's cool. I, yeah, I was just kind of curious, um, for myself and, and everything, what, what you did there, especially since, you know, you live in Missouri. Um, so it's a little bit of a, a remote working location, I'd say. Yeah, I'm the only the only remote employee and the magic of the internet. Um, yeah, it works. So <laughs> it's uh, I gotta get out. There, Exo Mountain Gear is based in Boise, and I get out there a handful of times a year. Or so and both for work as well as uh, quote unquote work, which is some fun trips and stuff like that. So there's some travel in terms of going to Boise or you know show season like in February we were in Portland and Salt Lake um, for Hunt Expo things like that. But um, yeah, most of the time just working from home and remote and, you know, the company, since we only sell direct, we don't have dealers, retailers, uh, online sales are 98% of our business. So, um, and I manage a lot of the technology in that regard. So it all is just web-based. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's cool. It's, it's similar. I mean, similar business model to, uh, Maven optics, their direct to consumer, um, company as well. And that's, I, I work a lot with those guys and they, that's was kind of their reason too, is we want to be, you know, face to face with the customers, you know, at the shows, the owners are there and they're the ones talking to everybody and getting feedback. And it's, it's, it's a pretty cool business model. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, um, yeah, I, it, there's pros and cons honestly, but for us, the pros vastly, vastly outweigh any sort of con. I mean, you know, it allows us to build our products in the U.S. And there's there's so many right things about it for who we are and who we want to be. Um, and it's uh, a privilege to be able to do it. Cool. Well, what I wanted to talk to you about today, Mark. So as as you said, you know, you've, you're a, a I'm going to call you a technical expert when it comes to stuff within the, the business. Oh, Exo. no. Hey, oh, no. <laughs> I said it. You didn't uh, w- within the business at Exo Mountain Gear. But you definitely have a lot of knowledge when it comes to the gear side of things. And specifically, I I had watched a video that you had done for Exo Mountain Gear on you know, pack, your pack list and going through what you would pack for, say, a four to five day overnight um, hunt for elk in September. And I kind of wanted to run through that that gear list uh, with you and kind of your reasonings for taking things and maybe some lessons learned with, with this gear and your reasons for it. Does it sound good to you? Yeah, sounds great, man. Cool. So to kind of go in line with uh, – your video here let's let's start out with um the pack that you're taking for something like a a four to five day trip let's get into your pack setup yeah i mean we have currently and this is changing midsummer hint hint um but we have three bag sizes currently and the most popular and the one i was using like for this hunt and really what's ideal for that three to five day hunt is uh the 3500 model we have um, and honestly, it, it works even well as a day pack. And so, you know, there's so many guys out there who they might be doing a day hunt in Pennsylvania or Missouri, a whitetail hunt, tree stand hunt, and then they might pack in for four or five days out west or, you know, heck at home. And so this is just one of those really versatile bags that covers that spectrum. And, uh, you know, if you're if you're kind of the lightweight minimal guy, you can take it up to it depends on the person. But I've done a week out of it. Um, most like your average guy would kind of max that capacity out about five days. So that 3,500 we have is, um, yeah, our best seller, most popular option. And it's what I go to the vast majority of the time for sure. Yeah. It's, it, it, uh, it seems like a good kind of middle of the road 
because I mean the the bags that I use are the a lot bigger as far as size the cubic inch the five thousand to sixty five hundred and mm-hmm. you can pack that down for a day bag but sometimes you don't need all that space I mean my brother went with me a couple years ago on the seven day uh, trip in Colorado and he had the the thirty five hundred from EXO and he did. He, the thing was about to burst the seams with everything he had packed in it, <laughs> but he, you know, he made it happen for seven days. Yeah. Yeah. I mean the, the true capacity of the 3,500 model, um, you know, the 3,500 model is that capacity of 3,500 is only rated for essentially the main bag. There's some full length side pockets and stretch pockets. You have some expansion in your roll top and lid and all said and done, you're at about 42 to 4,300 cubic inches. Um, and you know, it's just one of those things. I mean, so many guys want a bigger pack for the just in case. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I understand that line of thinking for sure. And I'm not saying a guy is wrong, but I would say if a guy knows he's not planning on ever staying out or, you know, most likely ever staying out beyond that four or five days, then get a pack that's sized for that. Um, You know, one of the things you run into is if you have space in your pack, uh, you're going to fill it. And so sometimes it's just a matter of, oh, well, my pack's not full, so I might as well put some more stuff in there. And that's, you know, maybe like the discipline of having a limit to your pack size is going to help you keep a a smarter um, approach with your gear, which honestly comes into play. Yeah, (laughs) it's it's funny when you say about filling it up and this is, you know, coming from me being an amateur with it. I thought I was, you know, getting the lightest weight stuff, but I ended up throwing a bunch of just in cases in there and everything else. And by the end of it, I weighed my pack right before I went in to uh, Colorado a few years ago. And with this is including food and water. Um, and my bow, it came to 72 pounds. Yeah. (laughs) So a little bit more than, than I needed. (laughs) And now I've slimmed that down quite a bit, but yeah, if you have space, you're going to fill it up. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, and there's, I mean, we, uh, I don't like to chase the super ultra light gram weenie thing just to have like a number on the scale. I mean, for us, it's all about hunting comfortably and effectively and, honestly just like hunting with energy and you know we're talking day after day if you're doing a five-day hunt what what you're packing on day one is going to affect your performance on day three day four day five etc and so a lighter pack and this goes with all kinds of stuff like being in shape and etc etc i mean it all begins to make a difference if you're really looking to hunt effectively uh day after day yeah so inside of that bag um, let's start with, so we're talking about, you know, going in for four to five nights. Let's start with your sleep gear and kind of your shelter. What are you, what are you running for a, a September elk hunt? Yeah, I mean, I've done quite a few different things over the years and part of it depends on the style of the hunt. It's like, are we planning on packing in X number of miles and setting up like a backcountry base camp and hunting from there? Or are we you know, staying much more mobile? Are we sleeping where we end up essentially? Like, are we just chasing elk and camp's going to be here one day and there the next? And so that, for me, that dictates uh, shelter choice quite a bit. Um, You know, several years, myself and uh, my primary hunting partner have split a shelter. Um, And we use a Seek Outside Cimarron, which is like a floorless teepee style um, shelter. It's fantastic. It's excellent. Uh, This past year, we were much more mobile um, on a couple different hunts, and I went back to a traditional, quote-unquote, like tent, like a double-wall tent, and uh, was using the Nemo Hornet. Um, They have a one-person, two-person model. I use a two-person model. It's not much heavier than the one-person, and the one-person, you know, it's, it's a burrito. Like, there's not much room in there to move around or to change or to have gear, whereas I'm a bigger guy, and the two-person is you know it's a still like a two pound essentially uh setup and but it's going to give you some space it's a traditional tent again so you're talking like tent body and fly it's dual doors dual vestibules so plenty of gear storage things like that so for two pounds um it's a great choice i've been really really happy with it um and that yeah that basically kind of covers the shelter there so with um with i mean that's a good thing to note for 
for guys as far as the you know buying a two person shelter for for one person to be able to fit your gear in there because it it does suck when you need to leave stuff outside and even if you have a rain cover or dry bags or whatever it might be you know stuff gets soaking wet and you don't want to be putting that on in the morning yeah and it having storage inside the tent's nice for like extra clothes and changing and then like this one specifically with two two doors two vestibules I can keep my pack and bow on one side. I can keep my boots and like maybe my stove and some things like that on the other side. So it's really easy to get up in the morning thinking of one morning I had in Idaho this year where it was just kind of wet and rainy and can stay in the shelter and cook in the one vestibule while the other vestibule has gear storage. And so it's a, it's a solid system for sure. I mean, especially if you're the guy listening to this who kind of wants a shelter you can use at home too. Um, I mean, speaking from experience with like Midwest and I know it's the same out East, the floral shelters don't work well at all times of the year. Um, like you're not going to catch me using a floral shelter in the spring or summer here in the Midwest with ticks and rattlesnakes and all kinds of stuff. I mean, September and the high country, they're fantastic. Um, but if you want to get one shelter that you can just kind of use at home as well as trips out West and things like that, maybe sticking with a lightweight tent is a really good choice. Yeah, I uh, I do own the Cimarron myself, and I love that for out west. I love the floorless design and everything for two people when I packed in with my dad and used that. And then last year with another group of guys, if it's two people, all your gear, I even ran a stove in it. Um, I didn't need it this past year. I didn't even open it up because it was so hot. But the year before, we got a bunch of snow, and it was you know really nice then. But um yeah, and but I can't use that in Pennsylvania. Like you said, rattlesnakes, ticks, spiders, everything else. Just I'm I'm in I was in the market for uh you know like a a double wall tent. We'll end up going with a a single wall from Nemo, the Spike Storm, and oh, yeah. that was way too tight for me. I yeah. set it up in the yard and I'm like I can't sleep in this. So if anybody wants to buy it, I have it for sale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like a, a single wall tent like that, especially one that doesn't have a like let's call it extra space like the Cimarron, like if you're uptight against a single wall, you're going to run into more condensation issues and then you're getting yourself in gear wet and your sleeping bag wet most most likely. Um obviously it depends on the conditions, but yeah, I mean be careful with a real tight single wall tent cuz that's definitely something you could run into. Yeah, I I had seen Brady Miller was running it and gave a like quick review on it and not realizing that Brady's kind of a, a freak with those type of things and can be <laughs> uncomfortable, I would say. But I for me it just wasn't it just didn't fit the bill. But yeah, I mean it's, some people it is, might, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean some guys can cram into a tent and they don't need any extra space. Like they're not concerned with moving around or sitting up or being able to basically do anything other than just go to sleep. Um, but for sure, like, I think there's something there, at least maybe until a guy has, gets used to it, if you will. But like some guys will crawl in a tight tent like that and just feel claustrophobic in it. So it's not for everybody for sure. Yeah. So within your shelter, what are you using to stay comfortable? Like a sleeping bag and, and sleeping pad or what's your setup look like? Yeah. I've, um, I've tried a lot of different things, not necessarily out of necessity, because I've tried a lot of things I've been happy with, but basically just because opportunity and because of curiosity. Um, this, this past year, uh, like if you look at the gear list online, um, I think the one that you're referring to, I was running a big Agnes AXL sleeping pad. It was comfortable in lights, and I was glad I had a backup in the truck because I had some durability issues with it. Um, so... I actually, I treated that thing pretty dang gingerly, but um, got a pretty good hole and leak in it. And thank God it happened to happen on a night we were packing out to the truck to move spots anyway. So I grabbed my trusty old, I have this uh, Nemo Tensor insulated sleeping pad that I've had for three years, I think at this point. And uh, just really happy with that, man. Like I've used that in a bunch of states and a bunch of conditions and it's not the lightest pad, but it's durable and comfortable and, yeah, just something I'm really happy with. So that's something to check out. Uh, they actually made some updates this year for 2019 with, like, changing the vowels and some some things like that that made it even better. So definitely a fan of uh, that sleeping pad. Mm -hmm. And then uh, sleeping bags. This past year I was using a quilt, actually, which I know is, a, again, a topic that might flip some people out, but... 
traditional sleeping bags, I've used a whole bunch of different things from like Marmot to Big Agnes to Nemo, and there's some really good options. Um, but I was running a, a quilt from a company called Catabatic Gear. They're like a little cottage company that makes products here in the U.S. And, uh, you know, the the quilt thing has obviously been growing in popularity for a few years, but there's always some some things I was not hesitant about, but just not real happy with, like from a design perspective. And the, when I saw the Catabatic, it kind of answered some of that for me. So um, I've been running that quite a bit and really like it. So I'm not sure how deep you want to dive into quilts versus sleeping bags. But uh, yeah, that's what I was using this year. Yeah. If, if you do want to just briefly explain what, you know, a quilt is, I'm pretty sure everyone knows what a sleeping bag is, but the, the quilt's kind of a, a newer thing. And my brother ran one last year and had a lot of success with it, liked it. But he said he definitely would have went with a wide version versus the normal um, in the in the brand that he had. Yeah. So yeah, like a premise, and we actually did a whole podcast on this, not the plug our podcast, but if people no, really want to geek out on like a 45 minute conversation on this topic, you can go do that. <laughs> plug it. Um, but uh, yeah, so a sleeping bag, when you, when you lay on a sleeping bag, any insulation underneath you it performs essentially zero, like it gives you zero benefit because insulation, you know, the reason that it's effective is these fibers create air gaps and those gaps essentially like trap your body heat and keep you warm. So as you're laying on insulation, you're compressing it, you're decreasing or completely eliminating practically all those air gaps and you're not getting actually any insulation value out of the insulation you're laying on. So the idea of a quilt came about because it's like we're carrying the weight and bulk of insulation that provides no benefit. So anything underneath you is not functional. So why should we have it? So a quilt is basically like a sleeping bag, but anything on top of your sleeping pad or anything under your body, if you will, like there's just nothing there. So some quilts open up um, and can actually lay flat open like a blanket. The one I use kind of has a sewn foot box, kind of like a sleeping bag. But then as you go up to like, say behind your knee, It opens up and then it's completely open um, all the way up through, you know, the rest of your lower section, your midsection, your back, your shoulders. And so it just saves weight and it saves space. The other thing I really like about quilts, and this kind of gets into what you mentioned with uh, your brother, is if, if they're done right and like you have the space, I, I'm like a, what's called an active sleeper. I toss and turn. I like to sleep on my sides. And so I'm going from one side to the other and I move around a lot. And obviously um, that can create some issues. Like in the past, that means I'm turning in my sleeping bag or I'm rolling off of my sleeping pad or getting, you know, I'm sliding off my sleeping pad and all kinds of weird deals. With a quilt, um, there's different ways that different companies do this, but essentially you have a way to attach the quilt to the sleeping pad itself. So as I'm rolling or moving from side to side, I'm essentially turning inside of my quilt and not rolling around with my quilt and rolling off of my pad. Um, I'm not sure if that quite makes sense. But there's also some really cool hybrid, um, I call them hybrid options. I'm not sure what the official name is. But like another bag that I've used um, and actually worked with Nemo on a little bit is called called the Argali. And so it's a traditional sleeping bag in the sense that it goes around you 360, but it doesn't have any insulation underneath you that we talked about. Instead, it has a sleeve for your sleeping pad. And so you actually slide your sleeping pad into the sleeve. And now it's kind of like a quilt, uh, meaning there's no insulation underneath you and you can move within it. So you can move on your sleeping pad without rolling off of it type thing. Um, but it's much more, it feels much more enclosed like a sleeping bag because it does have like 360 degree coverage. Um, another benefit with a quilt that I really like is there's just more versatile. So like say in warmer temperatures, you can clearly unzip a sleeping bag, but with a quilt, you can kind of, it's more like a blanket. Like you can throw it off of you. You can kick a leg out easier. You can, have it tighter to you if it's really cold you can have it more spaced out if it's warmer and vented so um yeah they're not i i want to say they're not for everybody but in the end i think of a lot of people try them um and try them right meaning like they have the right size quilt for them and it's a decent quilt where it attaches well there's a whole whole bunch of pros without very many cons so 
again, I'm not like saying it's the only way to go, but they can definitely be very effective. <laughs> is that is that a synthetic or is that is that a down bag? That's a down. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's a down. I mean, it's um yeah, I mean, down definitely is something I prefer for the most part. And really the only situations I would get away from that is just certain situations or climates I don't tend to hunt in. Like, so if you're talking Rocky Mountain West, September for elk, like primarily what you've done, what a lot, a lot of the listeners are going to do down's a really solid choice. If you're talking, you know, maybe coastal Northwest where it's wet all the freaking time or going up to BC or Alaska, like you may, you may think otherwise. And then, these days there's so many treated downs. So you got like what they call hydrophobic down, which is the down fibers themselves are treated with like a DWR or water resistance. Um, so they remain more effective if there's moisture introduced, then you have like down synthetic blends these days where you'll have 80% down and 20% synthetic. So that way you kind of get the best of both worlds. So there, that kind of, I don't want to say the game's changing, but there's, there's more, um, it's not as simple as down versus synthetic like it used to be because there's so many different like forms and blends and treated versions of down these days. Yeah. Yeah. I think my big Agnes is, uh, I believe that's a treated, like a hydrophobic down and, um, it, it, I haven't had any issues with it as far as getting wet and clumping up or doing anything that you typically hear with, you know, in wet conditions with, with down bags. Yeah. I think they can be effective. I mean, even going back quite a few years ago, I used a hybrid tent that was kind of a single wall at the foot end and then a double wall up top and got kind of a lot of condensation at the foot and lower end area. And this was one of the first, like the first year or two that they kind of introduced hydrophobic down. And so I kind of had some doubts, but, um, yeah, I, I think it's effective. I think there's a, a life to that. It's like over time that the protection, if you will, on that down can degrade, but for what a lot of guys do, do and how often they use their sleeping bags which is honestly not a ton of nights per guy per year for the average guy like that's still gonna last you a very very long time yeah okay so all right you ran through kind of your your sleep gear there a uh, next thing when you're when you're on a say a, a backpack style hunt is how are you getting your water and how are you filtering that water yeah that's a good one um can I go back to sleep gear for like two seconds? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I don't know if I had this. I think I had this somewhere on the list, but for some reason I'm not seeing it with my sleep gear. Oh, I had under miscellaneous. A pillow, like so an inflatable pillow, game changer. I was the guy who used to just like ball up my puffy jacket or some extra clothes or stuff those in a stuff sack, and that was my pillow. Um, but they have backpacking, quote unquote, pillows these days, inflatable, two or three ounces, incredibly comfortable, worth adding to the sleep system for sure. Um, didn't want to forget to mention that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's so, a big deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> water. Wait, hold, yeah, water. I actually, I want to add one thing on the, the pillow thing. I, I ran a, one of those climate, um, they just blow up pillows. And at first I couldn't sleep on it cause it was so loud on my head when you toss and turn on it. So I had to have yeah. to wrap it with like an extra layer of clothing uh-huh. and that was just me. But then I, and I was kind of forced to do another pillow. I was up in Alaska and, and a, a dog ripped it up. So I, I bought a, a Sea to Summit one that is like has almost like a soft, I don't know how to explain the texture. Like a, almost like a fleecy kind yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, is that thing awesome. That yeah, that's is, what I have. Yeah, They're that great. is so comfortable. But yeah, I I don't think I could go without a pillow. That was a good, good ad there. Yeah, I stayed without it for the long time and also honestly just didn't want to spend the money because they're i mean not that they're crazy expensive but you're looking at this tiny little thing and you're like really like 30 or 40 bucks please yeah but uh <laughs> yeah it's worth it in terms of sleep dollars for sure cool all right um, water let's get into that yeah so water um again an area where there's a lot of options everything from i would say you know, say like a more traditional pump filter to chemical treatments like Aquamira to UV like these days with something like a SteriPen. Like there's a ton of different ways to go. Um, I use something incredibly stupid, simple. It's just called the Sawyer Squeeze. And so if you buy the Sawyer Squeeze kit as it is, it basically is this filter element um, that comes with bags 
And so the, the premise is you fill up these bags with dirty water, you connect the filter onto the top of that bag, and then you basically just squeeze, like roll the bag essentially, and by pressure squeeze the dirty water through this filter element. And then you can have that filter element connected straight to like a, a pop-up like drinking cap, or you can filter it into a bottle. Or one of the cool things you can do is filter it um, through a hose, like output clean water through a hose into something. So the, the system that I use is the Sawyer Squeeze filter. And then what I do is output that via a hose, just like your bladder tube. And then on my actual water bladder, there's a Sawyer Cells, what's called a quick disconnect kit. Um, and so basically picture this, like my water bladders in the pack and then you have your drinking tube that comes out of the pack and obviously has your mouth valve and all that. So the mouthpiece with this quick disconnect kit just comes off like it comes off the tube. And then now you connect your filter to the tube. So now I'm taking dirty water in a bag, squeezing it through my filter, and it's actually pushing water down into um, my hydration bladder, which is in my pack. So I'll typically run like a three liter platypus bladder in my pack. And without removing that bladder, I can stop at any creek or stream or what have you, quickly grab some dirty water, and then just basically push it, if you will, um, filtering it straight into my pack and into my bladder. So it's a pretty simple, effective system. Um, the downside to like a Sawyer squeeze is just the way the way those filter works are like with these hollow fibers. Uh, one of the big downsides is they can crack, um, they can freeze basically. So uh, water expands when it's frozen. And so if there's water trapped within these filaments, the water expands, it essentially cracks the filaments and potentially can let like bad stuff through the filter. All I typically do is after I use the filter, shake it out really good. It gets rid of the excess water. If I'm really concerned about it, I will keep the, the little filter element itself in my jacket or in my sleeping bag sometimes with me when I'm sleeping so it's not freezing. But honestly, I've left it out freezing a ton of times. Um, primarily, I just shake it out and I haven't had any issues there. So there's a life to those filters as well, but I've run them probably longer than I should have and they're cheap. And so it's not something that's going to last you forever. But again, I would say your average guy, it's probably going to last you a few years. If it starts to get clogged, they also do include a syringe um, to basically back flush it, um, which pushes the dirty particles back out the other end. But it's uh, it's effective for sure. I mean, as we mentioned, there's like pumps, which are typically heavier and take a bit more time. There's UV, but then you have electronics and batteries and worry about things breaking. There's chemicals, but then you're talking wait time or taste. So to me, the Sawyer Squeeze is just light and simple and effective. Yeah, I, I, uh, that's interesting because I'm trying to upgrade, you know, personally my water filtration. I've been using just the Sawyer, uh, gravity fed filter system and I've had two of those fail on me in the last three years where when I say fail, it doesn't completely stop working, but it gets to the point where it's just dripping out. And, you know, I try back flushing it and doing everything else and it just, it, uh, had a lot, had a lot of issues with it. You know, I mean, because sometimes I wasn't able to get the cleanest water and it just, it plugged up pretty, pretty easily. And I, so then I tried, you know, the, like the Aquamira tablets and, and the iodine, you know, drops. And, and then also I, I did buy a SteriPen and I've been messing around with that. And that, that works for Pennsylvania when I'm out shed hunting with just an algae bottle or something, but it's not something I think I would rely on for a you know backpack style trip yeah i mean i know some legit dudes that that's all they use and so i'm not saying that they're they're bad but it's just not my thing i i'm a bit intrigued by them but honestly just haven't wanted one more thing with electronics or batteries or potential failure in that regard um and then i have also tried that gravity filter and had a similar experience there the the sawyer squeeze you know you can set that up in a gravity method you don't always have to kind of force feed it it basically depends on how used or how clean or how dirty that filter is, whether in a gravity setup it's going to continue to flow or kind of need some pressure of you squeezing it through. Um, but yeah, there's, it's, it's a good solution for sure. I mean, it's water filters. I don't think there's one ideal answer, but 
having tried a bunch of things, like the Sawyer Squeeze has been a go-to for sure for me. Cool. All right. So like if uh, we talked about water, what about your cook setup? So if you're if you're cooking any dehydrated meals or anything along those lines, <clears throat> excuse me, what what are you using for a cook setup? Yeah, we um, we did a big kind of stove review comparison thing on the podcast as well, and basically looked at everything from the weight of these systems to performance under different conditions, including freezing to how fast they boil to how efficient they are in terms of how much fuel they use. And again, there's a lot of good options there. The thing I grab more than anything is a jet boil that I've had for probably six or seven years and I've never had a problem with. And it's just light and fast and really stinking fuel efficient. And it has a built in igniter and I don't know, it's all, stained and torn up but it's just it keeps going and that's what i grab most but i mean any of those canister stoves are in general um the most convenient for like the type of hunting we're talking about you know you can get the ultralight like go with a diy stove or alcohol stove or something like that but for me at the end of the day i want something that boils quick um, and i want it to be fuss free like at the end of the day i'm tired i basically want to for the most part, eat and crawl in bed or it's the morning and I quickly want to be able to boil water, drink coffee and get going, something like that. So the canister stove, like a MSR wind burner, jet boil, all that works well. Um, I have used like more of a hybrid. So you take like a independent stove, like one of the Optimus Crux light is a really good one. And then you kind of have your own pot or other, you know, container for boiling water, even eating out of you know, sometimes those can be a little bit lighter, um, pack a little bit smaller, but to me, there's not a huge benefit to those versus like just all in one system, like a jet boiler or wind burner. So that's typically what I would go with. Um, just some like little nitty gritty details of like the, there's a, a little mug called the GSI infinity mug. Um, it's a lightweight insulated mug. I just really like it for coffee because sometimes I have something in my jet boil and then I want to be drinking coffee. So I kind of need two containers, if you will. So that's a good option. This past year I made something, um, to rehydrate my meals in. So I went from doing a ton of mountain house years ago to then getting more of like the premium meals, like Heather's choice off grid, whatever you want to do there to then also dehydrating my own food and dehydrated food versus freeze dried food. Um, rehydrating dehydrated food takes a bit longer. So you're just going to sit a little bit longer, like 15 to 20 minutes versus maybe call it 10 to 12 for a freeze dried meal, depending on what that is. And so I was thinking about it and with my own meals, I had them packaged and I thought, man, I want to keep this warm for 20 plus minutes. I don't want it to be cool when I eat it. So I took, there's these, uh, I think they're by, I want to say Rubbermaid, but I think it's actually Tupperware, but there's a, uh, it's like a, kind of like a oversized bowl, like a tall bowl and it has a twist on lid. And I took that and then I took the Reflectix um, insulation material and just kind of cut it to fit and then just wrap the whole thing in tape. And so I basically have like this sealed container. I can dump my dehydrated food in, add my boiling water. And now this whole thing is covered in insulation. Um, It sounds like really redneck and it kind of is, but it's really freaking effective and I actually really, really like it. And so that's actually what I rehydrate my food in. And then the cool thing about that, um, that little contraption is it's ideally sized to also carry like your snacks throughout the day. So for me, instead of having like this wasted space of a container that I only use to rehydrate food in, I basically have my food for the day. So like breakfast, lunch, snacks in this container all day. It fits in the lid of my pack perfect. And then at the end of the day, I've eaten all that food. So now I take it out and it's empty. I dump my dehydrated food in there, heat up my dinner, eat my dinner out of it, rinse it out really quick, and I'm good to go for another day. So yeah, kind of like cooking eating kit is uh, just a canister stove, like a jet boil or similar and that little contraption and then uh, a long handled lightweight fork or spoon is is nifty go with the long handle because if you're digging down in like a mountain house bag or something similar you're going to want the long handle 
Yeah, that's <laughs> that's true. You you'll have your knuckles will be covered in food if you use mm-hmm. a regular one. Um, and you're talking about like insulating with uh, the dehydrated meals. So uh, actually, Heather Kelly from Heather's Choice had turned me on to these like I don't remember the brand name, but they're like an insulated bag that goes that you put the food in. And I I haven't used it on a hunt. I've used it here in Pennsylvania, like when I was going on some shed hunts here in early spring where it was, you know, below freezing and wanted to keep those meals warm as they were rehydrating and you just slip it in there and it's kind of like a reflective material with a little bit of insulation and those worked pretty well too. Yeah. Yeah. Exact same idea. They're handy for sure. Yeah. So with, within that, um, as far as your food setup, I don't want to dive too deep into this, but as far as like how many, how many calories are you shooting for in a day or are you even looking at that? What, what is, what are you kind of looking for to have a target for your food? Yeah. I mean, it honestly depends on the hunts and how active I think that hunt's going to be and even the conditions at times. Um, so yeah, I've, I've gone everywhere from the guy who's like making a last minute stop to buy junk at the gas station to throw in my pack to making spreadsheets breaking down ounces and grams of carbohydrates versus fat versus protein and like completely geeking out and so i've been on every end of that spectrum i think the longer the hunt is and the more physically active the hunt is the more dialed your nutrition should be and the more benefit you'll get from that so like if you're running out for like a day or a quick overnighter, like sure, eat whatever you want, no big deal. But if you're wanting to to hunt and have sustained energy for multiple days, then an actual strategy with nutrition is really smart. Um, and it, I've even tried like different philosophies, if you will, uh, both in my personal diet, like around the year as well as with hunting. So I've done, you know, more of the the paleo and the the higher fat stuff and I've done the higher carb stuff and I've, I've tried all that. And ultimately for me, like a pretty balanced approach is most effective. Um, we actually worked with a nutritionist. Um, his, his name's Kyle camp. We've had him on the podcast and he actually has a free, um, like nutrition planner. Again, not trying to plug stuff, but if you go to exomountaingear.com forward slash nutrition, you can just download it and check it out. But yeah, if you want to get strategic, that's a good place to start. For me, you know, it also goes beyond just like fat, carb, protein, and what's the right food. When you get into an extended hunt, a big factor for me is just what sounds good too. Because you get five days into something, and like, say you've packed the same bar every day for a snack, and you're just sick of it. Well, now you don't want to eat, and now since you can't eat, you're not staying on top of energy, and now you kind of feel crap because you don't have energy, and you don't want to eat, but now since you don't feel good, you don't want to eat anything else, and like, so, <laughs> you know, like, something that actually sounds good out there is really important, um, no matter what it's made of in terms of calories or, or what type of macronutrients, if you will, but yeah, I mean, on an active hunt, I mean, I'll probably be be between if I'm not being super strategic and I'm packing based off of feel if you will meaning like I kind of know what I need and what I've done in the past I'll be between 3,500 to 4,000 calories um, which sounds like a ton basically a lot of times if I don't want to do a ton of geeking out I'll pack upwards of two pounds of food today like somewhere between a pound and a half to two pounds of food and it usually puts me in that ballpark um, in terms of calories, which is a lot of calories. But if you're hiking in the mountains and up and down those faces and you're carrying some weight in your pack, like most guys are going to burn that. But it, again, if you want to geek out, that guide actually goes into making some recommendations on taking your body weight and multiplying that by whatever formula to get you some calorie recommendations. And, you know, there's been certain things that we've done. We do this thing called the death hike every year. And last year it was uh, right under 100 miles um, in some of Idaho's wildest mountains and up and over passes and peaks and stuff like that. I mean, it's very like physically demanding to say the least. And I noticed a huge difference 
uh, working with Kyle and being really strategic on nutrition for that, like down to if you really want to geek out, like if you're doing hard climbs, fueling with simple carbohydrates, which in the end basically just means sugar, like in layman terms, immediately before or even during like a long, um, very physically demanding high energy output, like you're, you're gasping for breath or essentially or you're breathing at a high rate, fueling a big climb like that, like say you have a 1500 foot push with some simple sugar can make a huge difference. And then at the end of the day, that's when you want to hit more like fat and protein for recovery. Again, makes a huge difference. So I, th- I mean, I want to say, I think it's more than I think I know that being a uh, very strategic, like th- strategic like that can make a huge difference but not every guy is you know not every hunt is that demanding where it makes that big of a difference or you need to be that strategic about it yeah it, it's so I, have, I have two comments on that i mean last year when i did the 14 day trip i realized when you're calorie deficient for that amount of time and you don't plan i thought i was planning good you know i had nutrition nutritionist food but like it was I got to the point where I was I was taking in like 3,000 to 3,200 calories a day and uh, Mountain Tough Fitness actually has a, a calculator similar to I think what you're talking about with being able to take your body weight and you know how much your pack weighs and how many miles you're hiking and all this different stuff to figure out you know what you're burning and I did that after the trip and I was just extreme you, you'll never you know completely you know, get your calories on point so that you're taking in just as much as you're, as you're burning. But I was so far under that I, I, my immune system just was shot. I got really sick towards the end of the trip and it was just, it was a mess. But, um, we, I did a whole podcast on that with Dustin from, from Mountain Tough and he kind of explained, you know, why I experienced those different things. So, um, there's some more information there. But when you're talking about comfort food, if you could figure out a way to pack in Lay's potato chips, please tell me. I would. That's <laughs> that's like my go-to is like a a guilty pleasure type of food. <laughs> yeah, you you can do it. You're just gonna have to eat them as crumbs. I'm sure. Yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> yeah, like in terms of staples, and this is a, this is so personal, but like go-to's for me is a hunting trip. I look forward to. Obviously, because I'm getting to hunt and be outdoors and all that. But like on that short list of things I look forward to on a on a hunting trip is the fact that I can eat pop tarts. So like <laughs> for sure, I don't eat pop tarts in a normal day, but a hunting trip for sure. Um, yeah, there there's different things that are just go tos for me. Like wheat thins with some almond butter is a go to snack. Um, when we talked about like simple sugars for like those intense climbs, if you will the just gummy bears like those Haribo those gold package gummy bears are perfect for that um, I always end up typically packing some Belvita crackers or something like that one of the things I did last year for the death hike is dehydrated some bananas and sprinkled them with cinnamon and then I mixed those with just dry golden gram cereal so I just had this baggie of like dehydrated bananas with golden gram cereal it was amazing to say the least that was like something i'll continue to do but yeah it's a matter of finding like those things that honestly just sound good to you because as you said like you get calorie deficient it makes a huge difference if you've packed food that you can't eat on day three four five then you're going to struggle to eat it then you're going to be calorie deficient it's like as i said it's a cycle so it takes some experimenting and, and some looking but definitely i think guys either tend to grossly overpack the wrong things meaning they'll just bring way too much of one thing and not enough variety or i think most guys probably just underpack food in general and don't have enough calories so again i would shoot again it depends on the guy and the hunt and the activity level but if you're bringing less than like a pound and a half of food i I would really think about that yeah Um, i'm typically a pound and a half to two pounds and Man, when I did the death hike, I think I was carrying almost 6,000 calories a day, which is insane. But that's also not a normal day in the woods. Yeah, (laughs) no, that's I've uh, well, I've listened to your podcast talking about that. And and that just seems like absolutely the most grueling 
time that you could possibly have. <laughs> yeah, it's what they uh, they call type two fun. It's not fun when you do it. It's only fun when you get done and look back at it. Yep, that's um actually uh, Mike uh, Lilligren from Maven had added uh, type three fun to that, and he basically said that that's just basically like you feel like you're near death it's not even fun even talking about it but <laughs> it's <Yeah. laughs> when you remember it but that that kind of sounds uh crossover between type two and three <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so um um so to kind of keep uh going along with your pack here in, in that video you had talked about you carry then like in a an uh, emergency type first aid kit as well right mm-hmm and within that, are you are you bringing a whole bunch of stuff, or what? What does that look like? Just from a high level, you don't need to go into a ton of detail on it. But what what are you bringing in that first aid kit? Yeah, I mean, I typically I'm not sure if I did in this video. I think it might have, but typically I'll take one uh, pouch, and it actually is. If you look at the pouch, it's an old first aid kit, so it says first aid kit on it. But within that actual pack is kind of a oh crap kit in general. So it's gonna be first aid. It's going to be bow repair, gear repair, fire starting, um, like a backup compass, like all those kinds of, I hope I never need anything in this bag, but here it is type thing. In terms of actual first aid, I honestly probably am pretty underprepared, but I'm just carrying the basics um, in terms of like some athletic tape, some tweezers, some gauze, some bandages, um, some ibuprofen, some Advil PM if I want to take it to help sleep, like those very basic things. Um, I will say one thing is Luco tape. If you're a guy that struggles with blisters, and this isn't the only application for Luco tape, but Luco tape is fantastic if you're the guy that struggles with blisters because it it sticks and it doesn't shift. And so if you get something like that on as soon as you feel a hot spot, or even if you're the guy who's just prone to a certain area, I would put this on before you ever feel a thing coming on. And literally Luco tape, like you could put it on before your hunt starts and five days later, it's still in that same spot. So that's just a, something I always have in my first aid kit. But again, in that, in there, I will also have a bow repair kit. So it's just basic stuff of like a couple little loose Allen wrenches for key um, sizes on my bow, some extra serving material, extra dilute material, that type of thing. Um, gear repair is just some little, like say patches for my sleeping pad. If I get a cut, um, maybe a little bit of needle and thread, uh, tenacious tape is something that's very universal. You can use it to patch a sleeping pad or a tent or a down jacket or something like that. Um, and then again, just kind of some fire starting stuff. So that's, Waterproof matches, usually a little mini Bic lighter, and then some sort of like tender fire starter. Uh, one of my go-tos there is just cotton balls um, impregnated. Just put some Vaseline in them and kind of like rub it around. And those things burn in all conditions for a bit and help you get a fire started. So yeah, I usually have that one pouch that covers everything from fixing a person, fixing your weapon, fixing your gear, and starting a fire all in one. Okay. So with so moving past kind of like your emergency and your first aid kit, uh, another kit that I'm sure you have in your bag there is a kill kit. So once you have an animal on the ground, what do you do? You keep that all in in one spot, and if you do, what what are you keeping in that bag? Yeah, I'm pretty simple there as well. Um, and I typically will take my kill kit, and I say this not just because of our pack system, but there's probably equivalents on other pack systems, but like in our pack system, you have the water bladder pouch and it's oversized compared to your water bladder. So even if I'm carrying three liters of water in my bladder within the water bladder compartment, there's extra space, especially at the bottom. Cause most often you're hanging your water bladder from the top of the pack and then you might have dead space underneath it. I'll drop my kill kit in there cause I don't need to access it much. I want it out of the way and I just want to make sure it's there. And then if I need it, I know it's there, but kill kit is obviously game bags. I will typically have at least a couple like a black, um, contractor bags and those are multi-purpose. So that could be anything from, you know, as we're processing an elk and just want a clean place to lay meat down, you could lay it on those contractor bags. If you're in some sort of 
situation where it's incredibly warm and say you have to submerge meat in water, but you don't want it contacted with water, you could put your game bags of meat within the contractor bag, submerge that. So like there's multiple uses with the contractor bags. It could be a, you know, last minute poncho or something like, so those are in my kill kit. Uh, usually a little bit of flagging tape. So obviously the game's somewhat changed with, you know, you can drop a waypoint or follow a trail if you're blood tracking with Onyx maps or your GPS or something, but I don't want to ever have to rely on that. So I'll typically take some flagging tape, it weighs nothing anyway. Some paracord to hang meat and obviously just do all kinds of other chores or situations if necessary. And then obviously a good knife. So for me, yeah, game bags, contractor bags, flagging tape, paracord, and knife. And you're pretty golden. Obviously on knife, if you're running a disposable blade system or replaceable blade system, you want some extra blades. If you're running uh, a fixed knife, if you will, a traditional non-replaceable blade knife, you might need a sharpener. Um, but that pretty much rounds out a kill kit for me. Okay. And that's a, that's a neat um, idea as far as putting it in that water bladder sleeve down towards the bottom. Because you're right, that's just a, you know, a gap in space there. And you're not accessing your kill kit until you absolutely need it. So it's not something that you need to get in there and, and get to it, you know, any other point in the hunt. Yeah. And if you're, you know, if you're dumping your bag contents and God forbid it comes out, you know, if it's just stored in the main pack and it comes out and you didn't see it and you left it like that, hopefully that's never going to happen. But if it's tucked away out of the way in an insecure place, um, it doesn't have to be convenient, but yeah, it's just tucked there and I know it's there and you're good to go. Okay. So moving along to what, what kind of electronics do you bring with you? Yeah, I mean, uh, at the top of the list is obviously a light source. Um, so headlamp, I typically don't pack a backup flashlight or anything else. Occasionally I've packed a spare headlamp. More often than not, I'm just packing a headlamp and extra batteries. Um, I use a black diamond spot, which is also rechargeable. Um, and so you can recharge that if necessary. I guess that leads into having a battery system, but I use one of those dark en- energy uh, battery banks. There's obviously a million different battery banks on the market these days. Um, so yeah, I've, I like having rechargeable systems. So the headlamp, um, obviously my phone, and then I also carry a Garmin inReach mini. All three of those can be recharged from battery bank. At the same time, I still like having, at least for a headlamp, like physical batteries I can replace. And so I would be hesitant to get a headlamp that only takes a rechargeable battery pack. Like the best of both worlds is to be able to use a rechargeable system or just swap regular batteries. And the black diamond is one of many that do that, but that's something to look at. Um, so yeah, headlamp, uh, the battery backup, which I mentioned, obviously my phone just running that for on X maps and camera, things like that. And then the Garmin InReach mini, um, which is basically a satellite communications device. I can send texts. I can receive texts. I can, you know, God forbid something crazy happens. I can call for emergency assistance, hit that SOS button. Um, so that's pretty much it for electronics. Yeah, you hit the $30,000 button on the side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, I, I added an in-reach mini to, to my kit last year. And actually, your electronics kit is the exact same thing that I use. The, the Poseidon is a great, you know, charger. Has a little flashlight on the end of it, too, which can, I guess, it's not super bright, but could add in an emergency situation if your headlamp failed. You could yeah. use that. And and then the in-reach was just, was, was really nice. It was more of a, um, you know, comfort slash safety item for me this past year, being able to, you know, text out and you can send location with it, which was neat and, and everything else. So that's, that's a pretty streamlined, you know, electronics kit there. Yeah. I mean, those in reach, it's, it's one of those things where I know some guys are hesitant to drop the money. Um, but we've had, I mean, we've even done podcast stories with guys that we've talked to who've had to hit the button and more often than not, I mean, and this is cliche, but it's when you least expect it. Right. So like there's one guy who went out on an upland bird hunt, not even far from home and fell and broke his ankle. He was alone. No one knew where he was at. 
he was too far to like crawl out. It's like stuff just happens, like much less if you're doing a 14 day elk hunt in Colorado, right? Yeah. Um, so I mean, it's, I honestly view it these days is just like, it's just part of it. Like, I don't even think about the cost in terms of do I need it or not? It's just part of going, especially, I mean, I've got kids at home and a wife who's worried about me while I'm gone and all that. So, I mean, it's peace of mind for them, if nothing else, um, when I'm out there to be able to send them a text, let them know I'm okay. And, um, yeah, it's, comes in super handy too you know if you're ever splitting up or doing a group hunt you can send messages from device to device or uh, if you take a wrong turn while you're doing a hundred mile hike speaking from experience you could get back on track when someone <laughs> message like yeah there's all kinds of situations there where it makes it worth it cool okay so um, in addition as far as like the little the maybe kits that you might have do you have something for I don't know what the right word for, but almost like a cleanliness type kit. So, you know, you're like your toilet paper and toothbrush, things like that. Yeah, I mean, it's super basic. It's pretty much that uh, toilet paper, toothbrush, toothpaste and wet wipes is about it. Um, I'm I, not the guy who packs like the camp sud soap and hops in the creek or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, typically, typically, a little wet wipe bath is going to do me good. And, uh, I mean, the public might say otherwise when I get back into town, but yeah, that's <laughs> like from a personal care perspective is just that like, I can't stand not brushing my teeth a couple times a day. So that's definitely in the pack and TP and wet wipes are a must. Um, I've experimented with some like fancy versions of wet wipes. Like there's some companies that make them you know, not for just doing number two business, but truly for like wiping down your whole body in. And so they're larger and kind of thicker and all that. And, but in the end, like a good, I just buy the natural, like sensitive skin baby ones. They're non-scented and all that. And you're good to go. So that stuff's, uh, man, a wet wipe can do wonders in the back country after a few days. Yeah. Oh, it, it does. And I I went to, I don't do this anymore, but I did this at the beginning was I'd actually, you know, dry them out and then just add water to them. And then I just stopped doing that. It's not the same though. (laughs) No, it's not. You can't, no, it's not. And I'll tell you, those, those are just like, just the, you know, every couple of days being able to just wipe down your body a little bit, makes you, makes you feel fresh again. Yeah, for sure. As fresh as you can be, I guess. (laughs) What about any um, extra clothing that you're keeping inside your pack? Yeah, I don't like in terms of true extras, um, I basically pack an extra pair of socks. And so rotating socks is important, especially if it's warmer and you're sweaty. I mean, sometimes I'm rotating socks not only like at the end of the day, but during the day um, just to keep the feet fresh. And so those are the true only extras. There's been times where I've, Maybe this like listeners are cringing. There's been times when I have packed a pair of extra underwear, but I've also done like six plus day hunts on one pair of underwear <laughs> um, and hoped for the best there. <laughs> but like with merino underwear, I mean, you're not getting the scent and the funk that I mean, I I could not like wear synthetic, at least synthetic underwear for multiple days. Like there's no chance. But uh, merino is definitely a game changer in that regard. So I don't pack extras. I do obviously have layers that I'm not always wearing. So in terms of a clothing system, I'm always starting with um, a lightweight merino top, some sort of mid layer. Sometimes that's a heavier weight merino. Sometimes that's more of like a, this year I was using um, a first light piece. It's like a grid fleece, uh, the Klamath. So basically I'm always wearing my base layer. I have some sort of mid layer and then some sort of insulation layer. So like a puffy jacket down or synthetic that's pretty much it and then just the pants i'm wearing i will only pack rain gear if it looks like i'm truly going to need it meaning if it's looking like rain not like a chance of a shower on a day or two but like looking like rain then i'll pack rain gear if it's mostly clear with like a 40 percent chance two afternoons out of five or something a lot of times i'll just risk it and if we get a passing shower for an hour or two then i'll just hunker up or just hunt through it and change or something but yeah pretty dang simple there in terms of base layer mid layer insulation layer the pants i'm wearing uh 
and then just basically a pair of extra socks. So it's it's putting layers on and off throughout the day or as conditions change, but there's not actual extras or duplicates in that system. Yeah, I I've uh, that was I think the biggest thing that I learned was not packing extras of everything or not not even extras, just additional things that I thought I might need. Like I don't, I mean I you know packed rain pants in before and it did act as a nice like windbreak if you were happened to be in a position where you're glassing and it's windy or whatever but i never wore them and so i you know cut that out of my kit and and last year i think even in that whole 14 days i don't think i pulled out my my rain jacket at all and where and this one spot was one unit we were hunting it was actually i think just this one side of the mountain it seemed like every afternoon this you know pop-up thunderstorm would come through and it would pour but even other than that when with everything with clothing being so quick drying and everything anymore i don't see it as uh, as big of a necessity unless like you said you look ahead and there's going to be you know a ton of rain yeah i mean it's and it depends on your location and maybe even time of the year too right but again if we're talking rocky mountain elk september colorado idaho wyoming that type of thing a lot of times you're not going to need your rain gear like don't get me wrong there's certain years where i've needed it um but i would say way more years than not i wouldn't even touch it yeah there's there's a piece that i started using and i think it's going to kind of replace my rain gear um sika has this um piece called the the flash hoodie and it's just a wind stopper layer with tape seams but it only weighs like six ounces and so that's that's lightweight you can use it as kind of like a a windbreak layer but also you know for those quick showers it'll it'll you know you can get through it yeah and it might depend too on like your other pieces so like the insulation layer you use is a synthetic um, piece. So if it does get a little bit wet, it's not like a down, it's not going to completely lose performance. And at the same time, it's also has a DWR treatment. And so I've been in, you know, rain showers where I've hunkered in that and the DWR has done great at shutting that I've been in snow where it's a wet snow and it's done great at shutting that. So sometimes like there's some level of moisture protection in other pieces versus just dedicated rain gear. So that's like what you mentioned is a, a great example of that. Okay. So, um, to kind of go on an extension to your clothing system there, what about boots? Um, is there any, spe- I know boots are so specific to the person, but as far as with, with you, what are you looking for, for a, a September elk Rocky mountain boot? Yeah, man, this is like the toughest question, <laughs> toughest <laughs> question. Um, yeah, everybody's foot is different. Everybody has different preferences, needs, et cetera. Um, for me, I've run anything from basically lightweight trail runners all the way up to super stiff, super heavy, full leather mountain boots and everything in between. And I don't know if it's just me and I have a like an average or whatever foot, but like a lot of stuff just works. Like I'm not, I haven't had major, major issues with anything. Um, for me, the boot I just constantly come back to is the Solomon Quest 4D. And it's in between, obviously, those extremes. And it's a boot, but it's also on the lighter, a little bit more flexible end of a boot versus like a stiff, heavy, rigid boot. Um, And it is just one of those boots that out of the box I can wear. Um, I mean, we did that death hike last year and I was maybe the only person who didn't have a single blister. Um, I mean, just like zero issues in those boots for me. And Maybe that's just my foot. There are a lot of guys who love those boots, but I also know a buddy who can't wear them at all. They tear them up. So it's just one of those tough situations. Yeah. Um, I mean, in general, I would, this is one of those areas where you can buy online and get lucky. Maybe. If not, I would just be going like REI or somewhere that you can try on a ton of stuff. But even then, like trying it on in the store and hiking up a slope are two drastically different things. Um, so, yeah, man, it's it's tough. Yeah, the Solomon Quest 4D, I constantly go back to them. I mean, they're not perfect. They, they don't stay waterproof forever. Depending on how you're using them, they don't last forever, but they also don't cost as much as some other things. So, like, for me, I know their weaknesses and just can't get over how comfortable they are 
in different weather and different conditions with different weights and pack weights, whether I'm moving light and fast or packing out something super heavy, like they just work for me. And so that's what I just constantly come back to. Um, you know, there's a lot of other good boots. Um, I've tested like the La Sportiva Trango cubes, which if you have more of a narrow foot, um, and want something light, but with some support, um, would be a really good option. We've been testing these boots from a company called Technica. They make a, a lot of ski boots, but haven't done a lot of traditional hiking footwear. And they have a really unique system in the sense that it's a heat moldable boot. And so if you, you buy a Technica boot at a local Technica dealer, you actually, there's like this two-step process where they literally mold the boot to your foot. Um, everything from the insole itself to the actual boot has all these heat activated materials that conform to the shape of your foot. And so that's a really cool option, um, to look at, but it is tough, man. It's one of those deals where there's probably going to be some trial and error to find what works for you unless you just get lucky the first time on picking on something. And it's one of those areas that you can read reviews or listen to people talk about, but it doesn't matter because it's your foot and you might have a different experience. I mean, obviously you can see pro- positive or negative things about build quality, right? Like this boot just flat out leaks or whatever, but in terms of comfort and fit, it's, it's all about what works for you. Yeah. I, I wish that was something that like, especially here, I'm sure it's the same way in Missouri, but like Pennsylvania, there's nowhere and and at least where I live, there's not an REI within two and a half hours, and yeah. it's it's so tough. I I got lucky that you know someone lent me their boots that were the same size that I wore, and the boots just worked. So I bought them. They were Loa Tibets, and and I've had those boots now going on four years, and they're about yeah. uh, they they need I need a new set now, but uh, I I was looking at different options, and I'm like I, they just work. It's hard for me to try to change that, you know. Yeah, I mean, that that's actually the first, that's the boot I wore my first elk hunt, and I have zero complaints about them. They're a solid boot if that's what you're looking after. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, all, that's ultimately like one area for sure. If you find what works, stick with it. And I'll go so far, not just with hunting boots, but even with shoes in general. Like if I find a shoe that works for me, whether it's for trail running or hunting or something else, I will buy like three pairs of them just so I'm literally <laughs> like stocked up for the next several years, especially the beautiful part. And this is more on like running shoes than hunting boots. But a lot of those, there's a new version every year. And so the new version comes out, the old version gets marked down and I'll literally be like, oh yeah, I was wearing that. And now they're 40% off. I'm going to buy three pairs and not buy more shoes for the next five years or whatever. Yep. Yep. I, I, I know I did the same thing with, uh, some set of Solomon trail runners, you know, they, they came out with a new model of these, uh, speed cross, they like probably five of them since, but the, the, the ones that worked for me, they had them marked down to like 60 bucks. I'm like, I'm going to pick up a, just a backup pair. Yeah. And not only is the, the model that you had marked down, but sometimes that new and that quote unquote improved update actually could make it worse for you personally like they changed something about it that you now don't like as much and so yeah it's a funny game i i'm sitting here staring at a pair of shoes that i probably bought two years ago i've never worn but i'm gonna get them <laughs> you know yep. <laughs> yeah i i had been looking at the, the crispy came out with the colorados this year and yeah those are those boots really have my interest but I haven't been able to try them on anything else and and you know feedback from someone else is is you know, you can take that as far as like the build construction, everything else, but as far as fit, everyone's foot's different. So it's tough to be able to, to, you know, take that advice and say it's going to apply to you. Yeah. I I did see that boot actually, um, when I was at hunt expo and, uh, it's a good looking boot. And I think there's a lot to like about it. So it's one of those things where if that boot fits you well, I think it could do, do really well. Cause like from a build perspective and, and, the attributes that it has it could be a, a really good boot for sure i checked it out at ata and just held it and it just it seemed like a, a really good boot and i have another pair of crispies i use for whitetail hunting and and they they fit me really well it's just like i said it's just tough to change something that works especially in something as important as footwear yeah you know i mean for me you know pack and footwear is is, is can make or break a hunt i think 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, we say that all the time and we try not to say it because we're a pack company. So it sounds really biased, but honestly, like, yeah, pack and boots and th- like you can get away with not the latest and greatest sleeping bag or tent or stove or, you know, you can use a $7 headlamp from Walmart or whatever, but yeah, pack and boots are a must if you're if you're looking to get into elk hunting or similar, you know, kind of backcountry western hunting. Yeah. So I guess to kind of to round this off here, is there is there anything else that uh, we're kind of missing here that you think are like crucial items that you're always bringing on a on an elk hunt? No, I think scanning through the list, like we covered pretty much everything. Um, you know, and on that point, like that's that's kind of the point about a gear list is and this is this happens over time but it's a much is as much as it's about what you bring it's also about what you don't bring like what we talked about earlier with having a bigger pack and now just bringing stuff because you have the space or that whole question of just in case like there's a there's a spectrum of answering that just in case question meaning i'm bringing my garmin in reach just in case and i'm bringing um, a first aid kit just in case, and I'm bringing some extra D loop for my bow just in case, but I'm not bringing like a backup to my backup headlamp just in case. And I'm not bringing a machete in addition to my knife just in case you see what I'm saying. Yeah. And part of that comes with experience. Um, and that's not to say, um, experience like in terms of right and wrong. I just means in, in experience in terms of like getting out there and figuring out for you like what you do and don't need um and so there's going to be certain guys who are going to do this for 10 years and after 10 years insist that they have to bring whatever that i don't bring and that's certainly fine because this is like your gear and my gear and there's no right and wrong but that process is really important um i didn't start with this minimal of a, a gear list in the beginning it developed over time and so that's just really important to keep in mind um, in a huge, like a huge way to to shorten that curve and figure out what works for you is to not wait till September and not wait until an elk hunt, but just to get out there in Pennsylvania or Missouri or North Carolina or wherever the heck you are and do an overnighter, like take a backpack trip, go on a long hike, figure out what you do and don't need figure out what you are and are not comfortable with. Um, you know, something I used to do is print out my gear list of every trip. And then I would just start after trips, like marking a check next to items I didn't use. And a lot of times I would just say three strikes and you're out. Now that's not to say, oh, I haven't fallen and broken my femur in three trips. So I'm going to get rid of my (laughs) in reach. That's just like, (laughs) oh, I don't think I need this extra whatever. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's a process. It's not, like you can go copy my gear list, your gear list, Brady Miller's gear list, whatever. And you can learn from that, but don't copy it, like figure out what works for you. So it's, yeah, I mean, one cool thing, and this is again, zero to do with like trying to sell you a pack, but just if you go to our website um, under resources, there's a, a link that says gear lists and my gear list is there, which we talked about, but there is like, pages of gear lists most of all have the full printed gear list as well as a video of that person on camera basically doing a pack dump of like what they carry and the cool thing is that's like everything from a elk hunt to a mule deer hunt to we have some on whitetail hunts and so like you see all these different perspectives from different people and different hunts and just different gear lists and you can just check those out and like figure out what works for you, see what people are doing different and get ideas. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly right. I think I looked at so many different gear lists and, and everyone's is so different. You know, there's a lot of items that you'll see that are the same that go across and maybe something you should take note of, but it takes a while. I mean, if you forget something, um, you know, minor or you bring too much, you just learn for next time. It's not, you know, going to be a make or break hopefully. Yeah. And another thing like, keep in mind too is if some level of backup or extra whatever gives you security maybe bring it with you on your hunt but leave it in the truck 
And so even if you're doing, you know, this like quote unquote backcountry hunt, like what if, not saying you, what if you break your femur, but what if you, whatever, and now need this gear item? Like for most guys, worst case, you hike two or three or four or five miles back to the truck or whatever, and you have what you need. You know what I mean? Like say your stove craps out and now you can't boil water. Is it the end of your hunt or can you hike back to your truck and you have something there? So, you know, I do a lot of out-of-state hunts, obviously, being from Missouri. And so I have my gear list, meaning what I'm packing into the backcountry. But then I also have usually a bin or a tote of extra food or an extra stove or extra fuel or extra clothes or whatever. So, like, yeah, like it might sound crazy that you're five miles deep, but in the end, you can hike back to the truck in a few hours and either drive back to civilization or get the gear you need and get your butt back in the woods. Yeah, no, that's that you couldn't have said that any better. I I've saw my uncle was on the first trip with us a few years ago and he, he forgot his toothbrush. So what he, well, he hiked back to the truck and got it. Cause after a couple of days, he's like, I can't do this, you know? And, yeah. and there's, there's always, you can, if, if you keep yourself organized enough and keep things in the truck, um, extras, you can, you can definitely, it's not, you know, a life or death situation. If on like say an elk hunt in Colorado, you're, you know, you, you can get your way back to the truck. Yeah. It's cool. Well, that's uh, I think that's a pretty, I mean, that was a, a broad range of things to cover in one podcast, but I think uh, you did a pretty good job of explaining that and just kind of giving people, you know, an idea and a starting point for their research and to, uh, to start, you know, piecing things together, whether they're doing elk hunt this year or if they have an elk hunt planned for 2020, anything like that, you know, just planning it out and, and getting to test it was, it was, I think the biggest thing for me was, you know, messing around, like you said, overnight trips in the summer, you know, just going hiking trails, putting weight in your pack, doing things like that, just to, to get yourself familiar with your gear. I mean, opening something out of the box and throwing it in when you're going in for seven days isn't probably the best idea. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, no, for sure. I mean, if, yeah, if anybody has questions, I'm, I'm happy to help. I mean, you can just shoot me an email. It's just mark at And, uh, yeah, I mean the, the more like information out there, the better. And if anything we can do, whether it's like, you know, you and I through this podcast or whatever to like help you guys, the listeners get out there and just enjoy yourselves. Like, yeah, we're, we're happy to do it. Yeah, that most definitely. So Mark, where can we find some more information, uh, from you and Exo mountain gear and anything else that can help, you know, these guys and girls out with, with going on a Western hunt? Yeah. I mean, um, I don't, uh, I don't do much like personal on social or anything like that, but obviously the, the company's Exo Mountain Gear, that's just exomountaingear.com. And then I mentioned my emails just mark at exomountaingear.com. Um, I mentioned those gear lists. Like if you go to the website and under resources, there's a link for the gear list. Um, that nutrition plan I mentioned is also linked there. And then we have a free training plan, like so actual physical training to get in shape for hunting. That's all there. So those are just, just some good resources to check out. Um, yeah, my old blog, which still has a ton of relevant content, especially from a, a new perspective on like learning to hunt elk, um, is soul adventure. So S O L E adventure.com. And you can just do forward slash elk and it takes you straight to all those articles. Um, I'm not active there anymore, but there's still some, I think some solid info. It's funny. I've, I've literally Googled to search for information on stuff and had an article pop up. I wrote like six years ago, which is this weird, like twilight zone, creepy thing. Yeah. Um, I was like, Oh, apparently I already knew this cause I wrote an article about it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's, that's pretty much it. Okay, cool. And I, I did, I was on your website the other day when I was, you know, look, when I emailed you about coming on here and it looked like you had updated something there recently. Yeah, I'm tinkering with maybe writing some articles again. I just don't want to like <laughs> throw it out there and say I'm going to. But yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> nope, we're putting you some, right on the spot. <laughs> yeah, not just like not just on elk hunting, but just on some different outdoor pursuits and adventures. And now that I have like a family and kids and some writing some different things on that um, that side of the house, like hunting still my passion. And with the podcast, I get to talk about it all the time and talk to hunters like 
all day, every day through, through quote unquote work. Um, but yeah, I might, I might write some other stuff there. So you can, you can check that out, but yeah, I'm not making any guarantees at this point. <laughs> all right. All right. Sounds good, Mark. Well, Hey, thank you very much for coming on and, you know, taking some time away from your family and, and kids and everything to talk with me tonight. Yeah, man. My pleasure. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.